Praise the Lord. Welcome to this episode of Views of Indian Christians Expressed, Voice and Initiative of the Indian Catholic Forum. And I am your host, uh, Chote Bhai. Our topic for today is Co Vadis Indian Church. It is a sequel to the previous episode as promised, the persecution conundrum. Now, going by the uh, responses and comments which I got to the previous video, it would seem that it has generated a lot of light and a bit of heat also because we got a few uh, abuses, <laughs> a few rather nasty comments. And I would like to say in Hindi, aap se nevedan hai ki aap alochna karein, sakaratma ka alochna karein, isme koi dikkat nahi hai. Lekin kripya karke ashobni gali na de, baaki aap dekhte rahe, anand aayega. क्योंकि ये एक सत्संग है ये तू तू मैं मैं करके कोई चैनल नहीं है इन फैक्ट वी आर वांटिंग टू वर्क फॉर पीस एंड हार्मनी टुगेदर थ्रू एनलाइटनमेंट नाउ इन द प्रीवियस एपिसोड एज आई सेड वी फाउंड दैट परसिक्यूशन वाज अ कोनंड्रम विद नो रियल आंसर्स एंड टुडे वी आर कमिंग टू आस्किंग यू अनदर क्वेश्चन को व्हाट इज इंडियन चर्च नाउ व्हाट इज को व्हाट इज मीन को व्हाट इज एक्चुअली अ लैटिन फ्रेज which means where are you going and it is based on peter's question to jesus at his final discourse in and it's in john 13:36 so he asked jesus where are you going where are you going now and uh, this question was thrown back at peter in a movie famous movie by the same name when it apparently uh, peter was trying to escape from rome uh, the martyrdom in rome and jesus meets him on the way and says where are you going so dear friends this is a vital question for us where are we going where should we going be going what should we be doing this is what this channel is seeking to answer now i grew up in the exciting i would say 1960s and 1970s and that was a time of great turmoil and change in both society and in the church in the church at that time Uh, the the buzz word was aggiornamento an italian word which meant updating or modernization and it was used by pope john the 23rd the person the pope who convened the second vatican council the uh, two other buzz words are actually russian they are perestroika and glasnost the first was used by the then soviet president Leonard Brezhnev in 1979 and thereafter his successor Mikhail Gorbachev used the word glasnost now the first one perestroika means restructuring or reform and uh, glasnost means openness and transparency now this is a little dicey because we see that shortly after that the soviet union collapsed when you have openness and transparency you cannot retain power and that is why dictators those whether they are religious heads or political heads they don't want openness and transparency because they want to retain their power as it is but we have to move forward look we are living in a in the era of the internet there's a knowledge explosion every even small children know what's going on they know better than you and me how to operate a mobile phone so we can't turn the clock back now i'll take you to a little management funda in management we are taught two things areas of concern and areas of control now areas of con- uh, concern may be huge and large we are concerned about ukraine and gaza and unemployment and infl- inflation now this can have a very uh, 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 depressing effect on us it intimidating us it makes us feel helpless which is a wrong conclusion to draw however as we had told in management focus on your areas of concern what is in my control what can i do and this is what we are going to try and approach today because if this entire conundrum of of uh, persecution or harassment perceived or real now why are people uh, inimical some people inimical to christianity in india there are probably two reasons which they hold against us 
One is they say you are a for, this is a foreign religion come from abroad and it's got masters abroad. The second is of that of conversions. You are going converting people. So we need to address these two issues. Let's not fight shy of them. And the first thing uh, about the foreignness uh, of Christianity. Look, let's be very clear. Christianity came to India in 52 CE with the Apostle Thomas in Kerala. That is hundreds of years before it reached Europe. Then we have the second uh, visits during the 15th century of uh, the Portuguese. And of course they did convert a lot of people in, in Goa. There's, that's a reality. Uh, but thereafter, we find that Christianity remained limited to the Malabar and Konkan coast for several centuries. Now comes the advent of the British, the East India Company. Many people think that uh, Christianity owes its uh, presence in India to the British. So let me correct you with the facts. First of all, when the East India Company came to India, they didn't want missionaries because they said if missionaries come, they will convert people. If they convert people, they become educated. If they become educated, they won't listen to us. So they wanted a docile and ignorant population, which is why even in parliament, in the British parliament, they vetoed any support to, the, uh, to any kind of Christian missionaries. And we see this in the case of William Carey, the first uh, British missionary who came to India in June 1793. He came on a Danish ship and he settled in a Danish settlement of Serampur for the simple reason that the British did not want them in India. This is one example. I'll give you another small example from my own hometown. This happens this is during the Second World War when obviously the British were on side and the, and the Germans and Italians are on the other side. Now the priest in our church was an Italian. He was arrested. The sisters in the convent were German. They were confined. They were not allowed to move out of their convent. And they could write one letter of two lines once a year to their families in Germany. And that too had to be rooted through the British embassy. And they had also to make a declaration of allegiance to the British crown. So we see that the there is absolutely no direct link between the British and uh, Christianity in India. So I hope that we will now uh, give a decent burial to this so-called foreign tag. Now let's come to conversions. There are allegations and opinions on all sides. But let's go by the facts. Again, I'll say do the fact check. And the best fact check is the census of India's statistics. Now I give you, now we know for uh, the statistics, very common knowledge, for the last three or four decades, the population of Christians in India has been going down. The last census in 2011 showed our, our percentage as 2.3% of the population. Now I'll give you some rather interesting statistics from Kerala and Goa, because these are the two oldest uh, places of Christianity in India. And here I am showing you now this little uh, data sheet. Uh, I hope we can, we can zoom in a little bit to see it. Now the interesting thing here is that the, this is between 1961 and 2001, 40 years. We see that the uh, population growth in 40 years, the national population growth was at 134, I think I've got my finger at the correct place. But the population growth of Christians was at 124, that is 10 percentage points less than the national average. And now if we come to Goa, we see there's a drastic drop. It comes to 58 and in Kerala to 89, I think. So we see that in fact, in Goa, rather than increasing, over 40 years, the number of Christians in Goa went down by 9% and in Kerala by 2%. Now, this is not me talking. This is the census of India statistics. 
and I'm sure in fact we all I question why did not the government conduct the census in 2021 okay it was the COVID time then you could have done in 2022 with little adjustments why is the government fighting shy of the real data the actual numbers so uh, I move forward again a little bit now maybe we could also examine what is it that motivated and drove the missionaries from foreign lands to come to India and try to convert people see at that time the idea was that uh, those who are not baptized are going to hell this was a limited understanding of Christianity and obviously these missionaries also did not really know what other religions were and what they stood for however then comes the watershed moment which I said the exciting 1960s the uh, Second Vatican Council and in 1962 to 65 and it, it makes a totally changed approach to people of other religions and I'm going to quote some uh, 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 very important statements from the Vatican Council documents now uh, the dogmatic constitution of the church known as uh, Lumen Gentian it says those also can attain salvation who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel yet sincerely seek God Lumen Gentium 16 so we are admitting and accepting glad, gladly that all people can be saved by the grace of God if they live a good life second is regarding uh, other religions the Catholic Church rejects nothing which is true and holy in these religions, religions. Nostra Aetate number 2 so it is accepting the goodness and holiness in other religions and regarding conversion a very powerful statement which it says it is from Argenitis uh, number 13 the church strictly forbids forcing anyone to embrace the faith or alluring or enticing people by unworthy techniques so I hope that this will bury <laughs> the allegations of unethical conversion if somebody of their own free will wants that's a different thing entirely now other than fact checks of the past let us also think about the future a little bit and I have two humble suggestions the first again based on Vatican II is cultural and uh, Vatican has spoken very strongly about inculturation no more Latin or Syriac language for example and in fact Jesus knew neither of those languages and already have spoken them we are, we are asked to adopt local language and culture of the people that's why even in our churches today you'll see that from the Roman genuflection you have switched to the Hastanjali uh, greeting and also in place of, of uh, incense we are using Arti because we are respecting and accepting the good things in other religions now a small little thing which uh, which pricks me let me tell you and you may call it a little thing but I think it's a, a very important thing uh, you see we tend to go to our churches wearing our footwear shoes and chapel and walk straight into church I, I this is very offensive to me recently I went uh, visited Kerala and Karnataka and all the people there in big churches, small churches, village churches all remove their shoes and chapels when they go to church but those same people from Kerala and Karnataka when they become priests and nuns they walk straight into the church wearing their shoes now you may say this is a very minor thing you are talking about no, sometimes small things make a large difference and now I will take you to another point which I would like to uh, draw your attention to that is from Jesus' own teaching because I feel we have moved far away from what his actual teaching was and this is when he sent his first 12 disciples out on their mission and he says I send you as sheep among wolves Matthew 10 16 now we may have heard this many times but I want to show you this diagram to understand what I am talking about you see Jesus saying I send you as sheep among wolves now what happens if a, a wolf sees a sheep the wolf will be drawn towards the sheep isn't it and 
it may even eat the sheep. Now if it eats the sheep, what happens? The sheep has gone inside the wolf. And this is what we call incarnation, the incarnational approach. The word of God entering into the other person. This is what happened at the annunciation. This is what happened at the visitation. And this is the true meaning of sharing the word of God incarnated in others. Now take the second scenario. Wolf and wolf. What do we see? There's going to be tutu me me. They're going to be fighting against each other, arguing and uh, attacking each other. So this doesn't help. And look at the third option, which we perhaps have seldom reflected upon, the wolf and the lion. What happens when a wolf sees a lion? It will run away. It will run away. And what is this lion? This is when we go with lots of pomp and pelf, big churches, big buildings, big institutions, uh, we, of our, the superiority of our intellect. We behave like a lion. When we behave like a lion, people will run away from us. And if you think that being a sheep is utopian, I give you the example of the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. He was a sheep in front of the British. But the British could not defeat him. In humility, in simplicity, in non-violence, he could break the back of those who were much more powerful than him. So, uh, being a sheep is really very, uh, is, it's got tremendous meaning which Jesus has given us. At the same time, in the very next line of, of Matthew chapter 10, he says, Be wise as serpents and simple as doves. Now, he has given us wolf, sheep, serpent, dove. Jesus was very close to nature. He understood nature. And he is asking us, understand nature. Pick up the signals from nature. You will understand the nuances of how to move forward. That is the meaning of co And uh, this is our channel's uh, attempt of agiornamento, perestroika and glasnost so that we may all be children and one family of a living God. Thank you very much for watching this. Please like, subscribe, uh, share and in comment. In your comment, we'd also like your suggestions. What topics can we take up for the future? So thank you very much and God bless you.